Well, our scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of Acts, the 11th chapter, beginning in the first verse. Hear now these words. Now the apostles and the believers who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also accepted the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him, saying, why did you go? Why did you go to uncircumcised men and eat with them? Then Peter began to explain to them step by step, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. There was something like a large sheet coming down from heaven, being lowered by its four corners, and it came close to me. And as I looked at it closely, I saw four-footed animals, beasts of prey, reptiles, and birds of the air. And I also heard a voice saying to me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But I replied, by no means, Lord, for nothing profane or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a second time, the voice answered from heaven, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. And this happened three times. Then everything was pulled up again to heaven. And at that very moment, three men sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. The spirit told me to go with them and to not make a distinction between them and us. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Go to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter, and he will give you a message by which you and your entire household will be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, just as it had from upon us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave them the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could hinder God? And when they heard this, they were silenced. And they praise God, saying, Then God has given, even to the Gentiles, the repentance that leads to life. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, I read this story a while back as a pastor, and he was standing in this big, large, empty sanctuary one day. And he was talking mystically about how, given the awesome glory of God's infinite divine presence, Each of them is really nothing. He's standing there with his worship leader. And they're just looking at all the majesty. And the worship leader also affirms, affirms, looking up to heaven, Oh God, I am completely nothing. And they go on like this for several rounds. I am nothing. I am utterly nothing. Meanwhile, in the back corner, the church's janitor is cleaning away. And he's down on his hands and knees. And he's filled with humble devotion. And all the while, he's been repeating in a gentle voice, Oh, Lord, you are everything, and I am nothing. I am nothing. Well, the pastor and the worship leader pause as they begin to hear this other voice coming from the sanctuary. And they stop, and they listen, and they see it's the janitor saying that he is nothing. And the pastor nudges the worship leader and smugly says, Look who thinks he's nothing. See, I think one of the biggest problems that we have as humans and being sinful is we want to divide groups. We want to divide people. We want to separate. We're better than them. They're different from us. We don't associate with people like that. And it's taught to our children. And when we do this, when we we label people, we dehumanize them. And it's wrong. And our children pick this up, that there's people out there forcing them into categories, forcing them to behave certain ways. It's like this two little kids, a six-year-old Angie and her four-year-old brother Joel, who were in church one day, and Joel was just giggling and laughing and talking. And you're not supposed to do that as church. And this finally got to his older sister Angie, and she leans over and says, you're not supposed to talk in church. And she says, why? Who's going to make me be quiet? She says, pointing back to two men in the back, you see those two men? They're hushers. (laughs) They'll come make you be quiet. 
See, we're like that. We're always looking for someone who's going to come and pose their will on us and force us to live a certain way. And unfortunately, our divisions in this country seem to be growing deeper and more angry. I have to tell you, I've been struggling with my message this afternoon to the baccalaureates. What do you say to a group of kids who were born around the time 9-11 happened? What do you say to a group of kids who, when they were born, there wasn't anything called social media, but by the time they're five, it is filled with this world, and they grew up with the development and living in this glass bubble like we've never seen? What do you tell them that they've seen our country, our military, fighting their entire lifetimes? What do you say to them when even Christians are becoming angry and divisive? I'm still trying to figure that out, and hopefully by three I will. Now, I know this is not new. And when you study history, it seems like we're always trying to force ourselves, divide people up. And it's even happened even since just after Jesus' death. And our lesson from Acts is dealing with this. And these are the people that walked with Jesus for three years. They heard Jesus talking of his love. They were with him in the Last Supper. They watched him die. They watched him rise again. And they still want to divide people into classes. See, this is their culture speaking to them. See, hatred begins early in our children. Our culture is in fused in us at an early age, and it's hard to break. Even when we come to Christ, it's hard to break. And so Peter has seen this vision of God. And this vision was confirmed by several means. He had this vision, and then he was told to go visit these people. And when he goes and visits them, they reaffirm the vision that he had seen. And then when he preached to them and he spoke the good news to them, the Holy Spirit come on them. This has been confirmed to him. And he realizes that God's grace is available to the people the Jews thought were outside of God's grace. It's a revelation to him, which is surprising because Jesus, his whole ministry, was talking with people outside the faith and giving them grace. And now the other disciples, when he returns to Jerusalem, are on his case. You ate with Gentiles. You went into the home of Gentiles. What are you thinking? Well, maybe I'm Christ-like. <laughs> and they fuss at him. And they're angry. See, down through the ages, we've had all too many people think they are God's gatekeepers. Even if God didn't ask them to be a gatekeeper, they're going to pick up the role and say who's in, who's out. And down through the ages, these people have done much harm to the church. I read an article this week about traits of the religious gatekeepers and some of the characteristics they might have. And the article tells you can tell the gatekeepers because they have a form of godliness but deny the power of the Holy Spirit. They design and maintain and advance dead religious traditions of men. They're legalistic. They're self-righteous. They can be full of hypocrisy. They push to make everyone the same. They blend with culture instead of changing culture. They focus on the outside while ignoring the inside of a person. They take unto themselves titles they did not receive from God. They seek to please men rather than God. And they seek out admiration and respect from men instead of God. Now, this doesn't mean that in the church we don't have rules we go by. This doesn't mean we have a standard we live by. We just have to make sure that our standard is God's standard. That our way is God's way. That our will is God's will. We have to look and see, are we loving as Christ loved? See, we're not to be the ones to judge. Jesus said pretty plainly, that's my job. Don't take it from me. <laughs> You're to go out and to love 
and to share the good news and welcome people regardless of how horrible you think they might be, how different you think they might be, how far from grace you might think they are. No one is outside of my love. That's what he wants us to remember. In fact, it's interesting that the disciples have forgotten the very thing that Jesus told them the night before he died. He warned them that they were going to be treated in a way they are now treating others. It's an interesting thing he told them, recorded in John 16, verses 2 and 3. Jesus says, they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering a service to God. People will hate you thinking they are honoring God. And here they are arguing with Peter because they think they are honoring God. They are doing the exact thing that Jesus warned them would be done to them. And this is what Paul was doing before he had his encounter with Christ in the road to Emmaus. But what is neat about this passage is they don't end in that criticism. They don't end in that hatred. They listen to one another. What a powerful thing to do. If you disagree with somebody, if you think they're different, you listen to them. And when we listen to people, it's amazing what happens. A few years ago, I read an article, a band named Daryl Davis. He wrote a book back in 1998 about his sitting down and talking with people different from him. See, Daryl Davis is an African-American. And starting in 1980, he decided, I got to answer a question. He says, I don't understand why people hate me who don't even know me. And so he went around the country visiting members of the Ku Klux Klan. Here's an African-American purposely going out seeking Klansmen to talk with them. He was a musician, and that was his bridge, often time, to talk to people. And through his just listening to people, hundreds have quit the Ku Klux Klan. A couple chapters entirely disbanded, all because he wanted to listen to what they had to say to get to know them so they could get to know him. And he found out about the why. He said, it's very interesting. He said, you know, there's some people who are just plain mean. And they're just mean to be mean and they're angry to be angry. But that's not the majority of the people. He said, the most, for most of them, he says, at the core of it, although they won't first admit it, they express superiority but truly feel inferiority. And in order to elevate, elevate themselves, they have to push someone else down. See, that's what we do when we label people. When we give them names. As we push them down. Howard Thurman was one of the great theologians of the last century. He's born right around 1900, just up the road in Daytona Beach. He's an African American, had the first... Um, interracial church out in California in the 40s. When he went to visit Gandhi, Gandhi got up from his tent to go out to his car to meet him. And his, his servant goes, he never does that. That's how much Howard Thurman was known by people. And in one of his books, he was writing about labeling people. He says, you know, we have to label people in order to hate them. Because by labeling them, we make them subhuman. And he used this analogy, he says, in World War II, we did not fight Germans and Japanese. He, we, he said, we fought Nazis and Nips. Because that sounded subhuman. And therefore, we could hate them. And that's what labeling does. It allows us to dehumanize people. And this is what the disciples did. And accusing Peter, he says, you went and ate with the uncircumcised. He didn't say you went and ate with people different than us. He said, you went and ate with uncircumcised people. Had to label them. They didn't say, you know, you went and ate with someone that's different to us. How did it go? What did you learn? No, they weren't caring. They wanted to fuss at Peter and put him in his place. And that's what our society is seeming to do more and more. We are labeling people even more. Sometimes we do it without even thinking about it. Think about it. We label you. Are you a silent generation, greatest generation, a baby boomer, Gen X, or millennial, Gen Y? Something I don't know. 
We label people all the time. And it's not right. And I think the ways that we have have in social media, we're, we're taking that anger and that separation to a new level. We have things that we call now trolls. You post something on there and then people come and criticize it and say ugly things to bring you down. Christ calls us to lift people up, to not exclude anybody, to welcome all because Christ, because God's desire is that all would come and to know his love. And so we as Christians must constantly ask ourselves, who are we excluding by our words, our actions, and our traditions? Are not listening. Who are we excluding that God is calling to come? God is calling everyone to him. Ours is to share that message of hope and love to all. That's what it means to be a disciple. Disciple doesn't mean we get to judge people. It means we get to teach people and love people. Jesus met so many people who were outside of grace by the way they lived. And he never condemned them. He loved them. And I always love what his first thing he would ask them because he's listening to them. He's, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? I want to know you. I want to know your needs. And then he talked faith. See, we need to learn to listen. Not only to God, as Peter did, but to one another as disciples, as the disciples finally did with Peter. And when we listen, we do it with humility. And as we walk humbly, to walk humbly means to lift up others. We don't have to lift ourselves up because we have God's love. What else do we need? We have God's hope. What else do we need? We have God's grace. What else do we need? We can lift other people up because we have it all. We have eternal life. And the easiest way to lift other people's up is to actually lower yourself. To be humble. It is the act of taking the first step towards reaching out to someone because all the effort then was on us to lower ourselves, to humble ourselves before these persons and to get to know them, to listen to them. Mother Teresa put it this way, if we don't accept Jesus in one another, we will not be able to give him to others. I love what Arthur Ashe said years ago. He said, true heroism is remarkably sober, very undramatic. It is not the urge to surpass all others at whatever cost, but the urge to serve others at whatever the cost. And the 18th century preacher Jonathan Edwards brings it home when he writes, Resolved that all men should live for the glory of God. Resolved second that whatever others do, I will. This is how we're called to live. And this is something that we cannot do on our own. The only way we can live this way is we have to die to ourselves every day. I love that phrase by Paul. He says, I die every day. Every day we've got to get up and we say, God, I'm dependent on you because I can't do it on my own. I need to die to my wishes and live to your wishes so that I can share your good news. And it takes the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us. See, we should be setting the examples for others to follow. There's so many churches in Brevard County, it seems like it should have a tremendous impact. But it's not. Because we Christians are trying to label each other. We Christians are still angry. We Christians are still out there tearing people down. See, we can't wait for under society to understand what it means to love unconditionally, what it means to love our enemies, what it means to love those who hate us, what it means to love those who are different to us. We just have to go out and do it. And we have to be the ones that change society. If we have God's love, then we have everything. And therefore, we don't need to prove anything. We can then serve out of that love and welcome everyone. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for so many blessings. Lord, we thank you that you love us. Even in the times that we were unlovable, even the times we were living outside your grace, 
Even the times where we were inside your grace, but we did things that you asked us not to do. You still love us. You still call us to you. You still forgive us. You still fill us with grace. You still give us the same hope. Let us always remember that we cannot escape your love. And because of that, we can listen to others who are different. That we can share the good news to others. So Lord, help us to be a church that builds these relationships with those beginning in our community. That we go out and to share your love and let people know that they are welcome. Regardless of how different from us they are, they are welcome. Lord, let us be a church that welcomes and loves as you loved, that serves as you served, and that gave of themselves as you gave of yourselves. Help us to be that church, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.